Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. The less paper businesses use, the more problematic it becomes. Resolving the paper paradox. I'm Maureen Hearn, a manager of training here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. With me today are AIM Vice President David Jones, and from OpenText, we have George Harrow and Johannes Schacht. OpenText is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And we thank you for taking the time to join us today. Before we get started, I'd like to give you some pointers for viewing today's webinar. You can customize your own viewing experience. Feel free to open, close, resize the different windows to your own preferences. You'll see across the bottom of your screen is a list of all the widgets available to you. You can also download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources box. It's on the right-hand side of your screen. Also in the resources box, feel free to download the two white papers we have available for you. Feel free to ask questions throughout the hour using the Q&A feature. We will hold them until the end, and we should have about five to ten minutes to answer them. If you have any difficulty, technical difficulty at all, please ch check, click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon, and it covers most common technical issues. Um, if you can't find your answer there, please uh, go ahead and put your question in the Q&A feature. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted to AIM.org's webinar on-demand library in a few days. So thank you, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Dave. Good afternoon, and many thanks, Maureen, for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to talk about the paper paradox, something that not only sounds intriguing, but that's also widely happening within the business world without a lot of people actually realizing it. As Maureen said, my name is Dave Jones. I'm Vice President of European Operations at AIM. And I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so exploring this idea of the paper paradox before handing over to George from OpenText, who's going to share some real life stories of this paradox and how people are trying to tame it in the real, in the real world. So let's start off with a couple of definitions. Firstly, what on earth is a paradox? It's a, it's a word that we all know about, but many of us don't actually know what it means. Well, the dictionary definition of a paradox is that it's a statement that expresses an apparent contradiction that is, in fact, actually true. So let me give you some examples to, to illustrate this a little bit. And probably the most well-known paradoxical statement is the idea of being cruel to be kind. The two sides of the statement are, are seemingly in complete contradiction with each other. And we all know that sometimes you do have to be cruel to be kind, especially if you're bringing up children. Um, let me give you some other examples that, that I quite like. Um, so first one, I'm a compulsive liar. Well, how are we supposed to know if you're telling the truth if you, if you lie all the time? Second one is, is I can resist everything except temptation. And my personal favorite, the last one, you shouldn't go into the water until you know how to swim. As you can see, a lot of these are humorous, but, but in what you might call an ironic or a dark humor sort of way. The paper paradox, however, certainly isn't meant in any humorous way. So having built it up nicely, let, let's actually dive in and explain what this thing called the paper paradox is. Well, the paper paradox states that the more paper you remove from a business, the more problems it causes. And the paradox here is that paper is often thought of as one of the biggest hindrances to business effectiveness. So surely getting rid of it makes things better, doesn't it? Not worse. Well, the paper paradox would argue against this. But... You'll be glad to hear that I think there are several ways that we can tame this paradox to make sure that removing paper from a business actually improves things and doesn't make it worse. And that's what I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so discussing. To start with, and to start, I'm going to go back a little 
As I've just explained, the whole concept of a paper paradox is based on the need of getting rid of paper. And this is driven by something called digital transformation. So I'm going to start by actually making the case for why you should be interested in doing digital transformation. Now, for many of you, this, this won't be new. This won't be news. Um, but it's important, in my opinion, to set the scene before we go too much further. Once I've done that, I'll take a look at whether this, this thing called the paper paradox is actually true. And if it is, I'll look at some examples of where and how this might be happening in everyday life. And finally, we'll explore some of the ways in which we might be able to get around the issues that are caused by this paradox. OK, so that's the plan. Let's dive straight in. So digital transformation is really the starting point for this conversation. And digital transformation can be quite a complex little thing. But at its simplest, digital transformation works on the basis that information is your most important business asset. And we need to remember that, that key facet as we walk through this whole discussion today. The challenge that many businesses have is that much of their information is not digital. It's often paper-based. And, and for many people, digital transformation simply means the act of going paperless. However, it can, and in my opinion, it should be much, much more than that. Digital transformation should refer to all of the changes associated with the application of digital technology in all aspects of a business. So this means all aspects of transforming a business. And today, that looks at things like tools and technologies such as cloud, social, mobile, and analytics, and how they're used in combination within a business to make the most of the information assets that any given business has got at their disposal. Now, this obviously is a fairly broad definition. And many people do indeed start off with much smaller projects and with much lesser ambitions than trying to digitally transform their whole business all in one go. But removing paper from the business is very much needed to get the best from all projects, large or small. So irrespective of the size of digital transformation project undertaken, for me, there are really three key aspects that need to be taken into account. Think about it. They're people, technology, and process. Now, for any change to be effective, people need to be informed, they need to be engaged, consulted, and trained at the very, very least. There's a whole industry sector growing up around change management, and it's absolutely no different here. Second piece is technology. We saw in the previous slide what types of technology are being used to facilitate digital transformation. And the use of these technologies needs to be carefully integrated to the people and to the process elements here for success to occur. And that process piece is based around how things are actually done within the business. We'll see more on this in a few moments, so I'm not going to labor this point right now. In essence, though, these three pieces all need to be taken into account when you're considering digital transformation. If any of them are missing, then the solution that you deploy is likely not to be a success. So we've looked at what digital transformation is and what we need to consider to deliver it, but why should we actually be interested in delivering it? Well, based on some of our recent paper-free progress research, three key drivers for digital transformation were forthcoming. Firstly, the idea that business at the speed of paper is no longer acceptable. Now, this is what we've been hearing in research for the past three to four years, and it quite simply isn't changing. More than anything, businesses that do still operate at the speed of paper have simply been overtaken by those that don't. Secondly, people are conscious that remote working is becoming more and more commonplace, but that paper and remote working aren't particularly happy bedfellows. They don't work together. Think about it. If you're working from home, 
and all of the information that you need is on paper in the office, then it's going to be difficult to get much done, to be honest. If that content is digital, then it makes accessing that content much easier remotely. But then again, you also need to consider the processes. It's great if you can access content remotely, but again, if you need to be in the office to process it, then it, it sort of defeats the purpose a little bit. But the good news is the last piece on this slide, the fact that 57% of organizations are now committed to doing digital transformation. So this isn't a nice to have anymore, but something that people are really committed to doing. And that's huge. What's also nice is that these people also realize and are fully aware of the fact that paper free is the starting point for this project. So in short, people are ready for this thing called digital transformation. So before we move off of digital transformation, let's quickly take a look at the benefits that those that are doing this already, look at the benefits that those guys are seeing. And some of the highlights here include faster customer responses from 43% of respondents. So basically being able to respond to phone calls or emails or anything that's customer related. And when you think that at the end of the day, your customers are the people that pay the bills, then dealing with them quicker has got to be a good thing. Secondly, we see higher productivity by 40% of people. And again, if employees are more productive, then in theory, more work gets done, so everybody's happy. And finally, one of the unsung heroes for me of digital transformation is that it becomes much easier to track compliance. Why? Well, by virtue of having a much cleaner and a much more accessible audit trail. As I say, this, this is unsung, uh, largely because it's not a sexy benefit. It's not something that people shout about a lot of the time. But it's a very important one in, in the day and age that we live in today where we all need to maintain compliance wherever we possibly can. So that was the case for digital transformation. Um, as I said, it's probably not news to a lot of you, but I think it's a pretty compelling case. And obviously 57% of organizations now feel that it's compelling enough to, to move ahead with it. But what about this, this paper paradox? If the paradox is true, then as we remove paper, it starts to cause more problems. So by definition, as we move towards digital transformation, paper is going to cause more and more problems. So let's dive into this and, and explore this paradox in a little bit more detail. So visually, what we're looking at is this. Over time, the amount of paper within a business is dropping. And initially, that reduces the number of problems caused by paper. But then very quickly, the number of problems grows. Now, you might want to call this the, the long tail, if you like, or, or sometimes the same sort of phenomenon can be seen with, with what's known as the 80-20 rule. For example, 20% of the paper is causing 80% of the problems. But whichever way you skin this cat, there does appear to be an issue. But why? Well, let's take a look at some of the issues that manifest themselves here. First up, paper is slow. We've already established this, but what's that got to do with anything? Well, it really ties into the second point that says that paper isn't the only input anymore. Or conversely, digital isn't the only input. If we have a digital process, one that expects digital content, when a piece of paper comes in and reacts with that process, it causes problems. And as the number of paper processes reduces, whenever paper does arrive, the problem's amplified because those processes quite simply aren't built to deal with it. And this is moving on to the last point being made here. In any process, exceptions are the biggest challenge in dealing with exceptions. And what we're talking about here is paper being the exception. 
So it's posing a bigger and bigger challenges as time goes on. And bear in mind, when paper does arrive, unless the process has been designed properly, everything behind the paper in that queue will simply stop until the paper is dealt with. Now, that's obviously not ideal. And the real reason for this is because processes that are designed for digital are quite simply not the same as their paper-based equivalents. And very often, they need to be completely rethought, not just for the new digital content, but more often than not so that they're compatible with both digital and paper and data content. And if you don't do this, well, essentially, you're just slapping lipstick on a pig, as, as the saying goes. If you simply digitize a paper-based process, then what you have is a digitized paper process. You don't necessarily have the most effective process, or even one that will work. As they say, a pig is still a pig with or without lipstick on it. So let's take a, a closer look at how this actually works. So picture this. Once upon a time, we had a contract signing processes that works along these lines. A contract arrives in the post and is routed through to the person that needs to sign for it. Pretty simple stuff. That contract then duly gets signed. Of course, once it's signed, a copy of that signed contract is taken and stored locally, while the original copy is popped back in the post and sent off to the relevant company. And this is the way that contracts have been signed and processed and dealt with for years. And the process works absolutely fine for paper. But let's move this forward. Let's try and digitize this process. OK, so we've got a good step, a good start of the process, to the process. We've got the contract arriving via email as an attachment. And for many, that's unfortunately as far as it goes without any problems. Because pretty much the first thing that happens is that that contract gets printed. Now, as recently as December 2015, our research showed that 50% of organ, or sorry, 56% of organizations still require things like contracts, orders, and booking forms to be signed on a piece of paper. But the new process just gets very, very messy straight away. Of course, let's assume that, that we do this. That signed contract will then need to be filed because that's what always happens with pieces of paper within the business. Then the contract will get scanned back in, ready to be emailed to the company. However, in the meantime, that scanned signed contract will need to be added to the ECM system, of course. But many people will also file that document, that PDF scan, to a shared drive because they like to have a local copy just in case. That's just the way that things work. And finally, the contract gets sent back to the originating company. Now, as you can see, none of this is, is ideal. But this is a classic case of where a paper process is half digitized. And it actually makes much more work than if it was simply still a paper-based process. This is a classic case of the paper paradox in action. So let's move things on a little bit. Let's go to a process that has had a little bit of thought applied to it. So we're still working with contracts, and the contract has arrived digitally via email, like it did on the last slide. But now we have a digital signature process. So that document can be electronically signed. A copy can be routed straight to the ECM system, and a main copy sent straight back to the company being dealt with. Perfect. And in reality, this is where most people want to get to. 79% of our respondents agree that all businesses should have an e-signature mechanism to allow them to get to streamline processes like this. So we're all good. Well, not quite. And this is where we start to see the paper paradox again. Here, we've got rid of most of the paper. In fact, we've got rid of all of the paper. But when paper does come into this process, 
the wheels start to fall off a little bit. If a piece of paper comes in, now what we have to do is scan the paper, turn it into a PDF, and pass it into the digital signature process. Not a huge inconvenience, you might say, but it's still not as simple as that main process. And also think of it like this. As more and more content is being born digital or arriving as digital contract, that scanner will be used less and less, meaning that people become unfamiliar with its use. It potentially starts to, to start creaking and not working. And that each time it gets used, it takes a little bit longer and it becomes a little bit more inconvenient. So what we've got here is overall a much, much better situation, but still one that's experiencing the paper paradox. Okay, so we're almost there. We've looked at the case for digital transformation and found it to be a, a pretty compelling one. But then we've hit the paper paradox and we've seen some, some very simple, but I'm sure very familiar examples of this in action. So finally, let's move on to, to how we can look at starting to tame this paradox. Now, for me, taming the paradox is essentially quite simple. It's all about ensuring that capture is front and foremost of your strategy. Think back to the examples that we looked at. Once we've gotten over the hurdles of actually rethinking the process and making sure that the right technology was being used, then the only issues that we found came when paper was introduced into a process that, quite frankly, wasn't expecting it. So let's use capture to get around that. Simple. But the key thing here is that we don't need to limit that thinking to capturing from paper. Capture is now much more than just taking a, a picture of a piece of paper and saving it as a PDF. Now, capture in the 21st century is about digitization of content. It's about automatic identification of key information in that content. It's about extracting key information from that content to be used elsewhere. And it's about routing the resulting content and metadata straight into the appropriate people, workflows, and processes. But there's more. Capture can now work with any type of content, be that paper, emails, images, text messages, social media streams, and, and so on and so forth. And it can also be utilized on multiple devices. I'm sure that most of you have got smartphones in your pockets. Well, if you do, then you have one of the most useful mobile capture devices on the planet and one of the most powerful. If you combine that mobility aspect with the power that you've got in your smartphone, then you've got the ability to capture content easily and much earlier in the process was previously possible. And that drives me to a very simple conclusion. Capture can be the key to taming the paper paradox. Well, is it really that simple? Well, 40% of organizations report that they still got, at best, an ad hoc approach to this idea of mixed media input or content coming from different places. So we're not quite there yet in the real world, but I think it can be that simple if it's done properly. What we need to do is we need to look at capture early, and we need to look at capture of any content from any number of different devices. We need to capture into consistent workflows. Essentially, we have to move the content to where it needs to go once we've captured it. And then we need to get it into processes. Think about it, the workflows do the routing of the content to the right place, but the digital processes do the real work. And remember, these are now processes that we've resought out, that we've, that we've actually looked at to enable any type of content being fed into it at the start. If we get all three of these aspects right, then we start to tame the paper paradox. It's as simple as that. So looking at this visually, we've got inputs on the left-hand side, inputs to the process of various types now. 
we have electronic input, we have paper, and potentially we've even got pure data coming in from, from data streams wherever. These then get fed directly into the capture and the routing engine as quickly as possible. What that does is it serves two purposes. Firstly, it routes content through to the process element really quickly, really efficiently. And it then moves the results out to the, the big bad world or into an archive or wherever it needs to go. But secondly, and equally, if not more importantly, it identifies the exceptions quickly. And it moves them out of the regular processing stream and into a separate stream. The sole purpose of that separate stream is to deal with those exceptions. So it can do it quickly and easily. What this means is that the primary stream of work across the top of that screen doesn't get clogged up with exceptions. It doesn't get clogged up with things that stop the process working. All of this is very simple, but very effective. So I'm almost done. Um, and let's wrap up my section with some conclusions. So it's pretty clear to me that digital transformation is absolutely at the top of the IT agenda for businesses. We've looked at the benefits, we've looked at the drivers for this. But we've also established that if digital transformation isn't done properly, then very quickly challenges arise and this thing called the paper paradox sticks its ugly head into our businesses. We've also looked at some examples of the paper paradox in action. We've explored ways to tame it. And, and I've identified capture as, for me, holding the key to both enabling the digital transformation process in the first place, but also to taming the paper paradox. So at this point in the webinar, I'm going to hand the baton over, so to speak, to George Harrow from OpenText, who's going to share with us some ideas and some explanations of how this can actually be done in the real world. So George, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so firstly, I'm going at Capture from a, a different angle. Um, here's a picture of the Grand Canyon. And on one side of the canyon is information that's coming into the business from various sources and in various formats, like emails, attachments, PDFs, and paper. And on the other side is the structured processes that we want to feed that information into. And the big divide between the unstructured content and the structured world of IT that it needs to feed into can be bridged by capture and analysis of those unstructured documents. So that's what we're trying to do. And to, to transform the pixels into actionable companies need to be able to capture the documents coming in from the various sources and in the various formats, collect and classify them and extract the data and and push them, feed them into the business applications like SAP, Oracle, and Microsoft. And this is the starting point for companies to be able to offer the best services externally to their customers because if they're digitizing internally their own processes and simplifying things to make themselves more effective, then they can offer improved customer uh, experience to their customers. And Capture is the on-ramp and the starting point to that. So we see four steps towards becoming a digital organization with the ability to digitally transform. And these steps build on one another, starting with capture to archive, the most fundamental application of document capture technology, where you're just scanning paper to convert it to electronic documents for storage. And it's typically a high volume sent solution. And the, the conversion of uh, paper archives into electronic documents can reduce paper filing and storage costs. And you can apply metadata so that documents can be found or linked back to the original paper documents if you're still keeping them. Step two is making documents available full text search. So rather than just scanning, uh, you're, you're making them fully searchable and adding, which adds value because you can then find uh, context much easier and you can cut and paste things into other documents. And it improves your information quality because you can share information. 
and you can find content much easier for audit or litigation. Uh, Step three is where it gets really interesting. It's the capture to workflow. So this is the ability where you're scanning documents directly to the relevant business applications and workflows. And this can drive significant efficiencies when you're classifying, indexing, and extracting data off the documents. Um, for, instance, for example, for an insurance company, uh, you can uh, determine whether a document coming into the business is a claim or an invoice or some other form uh, containing important information. And Insurance companies have to be able to process, store, and generate a broad range of document types because their customers interact with them in, in so many different ways. And it's, I've got a breakdown here of uh, one particular insurance company we work with. And unsurprisingly, email represents a, a large amount of their inbound processing volume. Uh, emails a day coming in. Um, and they have to they have to be able to uh, handle the various attachments that come in as well because they're not uh, they they have limited control over the formats that uh, customers send to them so they actually their their transformation system can accept 300 different formats so whatever the customer throws at them they can transfer transform into um, PDFAs for long term preservation so, so it can be used along the process. They get 10,000 pieces of paper per day. So they're using a, an external scanning provider to digitize postal mail and supply PDAs, PDFAs back into them. And then if, as they have to reply back to customers by letter, then outbound external prints also uh, classified as well uh, against the claims or policy number. And they also have 50,000 images a day, typically arriving as JPEGs and email, uh, to email attachments or uh, via supply chain systems. And these are determining or establishing proof, loss, or underwriting evidence. So they have many different types of files coming in to the organization, to the insurance company, and they need to capture all the inbounds, email, fax, digitized paper correspondence, and um, convert the metadata as part of the process which can then allow them to uh, delete the original source documents because they're transformed uh, into, into PDFAs. And as I say, over 300 different native file types can be, uh, can be converted to PDFA. The classify step uh, performs OCR and intelligent capture recognition on, on structured correspondence coming in like emails or faxes or invoices. Um, and that can derive uh, claim or policy numbers and set the appropriate lifecycle the ECM repository. Manage is, is that ECM repository that's uh, providing the, the content management to underpin the claims and policy administration. Uh, action is where the uh, document notifications are raised for the line of business applications like BPM, uh, the claims and policy management systems to action and drive workflow. And lastly, archive works in tandem with that ECM system to manage the retention and disposal through, uh, in, uh, through formal uh, information lifecycle management. So this is a complete workflow of unstructured documents. If you think about the Grand Canyon example, where we're bringing unstructured information into a structured process here. And it solves the paper paradox because you're now digital and you can transform your business and for an insurance company that means that the claims response times can typically drop from from days to minutes and as we just heard in our day's research there into the benefits of digital transformation he said 43 percent uh, faster response time so for insurance company digital transformation means being able to do that being being competitive staying competitive and winning new uh, winning new deals um, because you're better than your competitors So finally, step four is fully automated business transactions. And uh, typically, these are departmental solutions, so it can be used in all industries. And for highly standardized processes, the goal isn't just to support business workflows, but to fully automate them. Processing invoices, uh, purchase orders, processing checks and tax administration. And the, the task of the capture software is to extract all the business data to posting record for the back-end system 
And with that solution, you ideally never ever touch the document again after it's scanned. But processing is a good example of capture to process applications and things like invoice numbers, invoice dates, process order numbers, um, amounts and line item details, they can all be extracted with very high precision and uh, that data can be, uh, can be posted without any human intervention. And this is, this is what the school district of Palm Beach County has implemented. They have more than 21,000 employees, including 12,000 teachers. And the accounts payable processes 175,000 invoices a year for the, all the schools and departments within the school districts. Uh, 175,000 is actually a low number of invoices, uh, and of course we've got much bigger in, uh, installations and examples I could talk about, but this particular case study is interesting because of the low volume. So and though it's such a low volume, it was still worth, it still made sense to invest in the capture to process solution. So the, challenge they, the challenges they had were to, um, the, the fact that processes were very manual and labor intensive with cumbersome paper-based records retention processes and a lack of visibility, lack of visibility into uh, invoice process. And uh, now with a capture to pay process in place, um, it feeds directly into their Oracle PeopleSoft accounts payable system that the department uses. So they've eliminated the repetitive manual and paper-based processes and they, they've got a much faster invoice processing and they're reducing their paper storage costs. They've automated the processes and they've been able to reduce headcount requirements and they've actually gone down from a, a accounts payable department of 16 down uh, through attrition. And uh, they've, they have increased visibility and accountability, uh, accountability for invoice, uh, for the whole invoice process. main points, reducing operational costs and improving information quality are good, but the real value is when you get to the third main point, accelerating because this is, this is where you're shortening cycle times, you're reducing exception processing, you're enhancing customer relationships. So this means that companies can offer a service to their customers and be beating their competitors to get new customers. So it's adding to the top line profit rather than just reducing costs from the bottom, rather than just saving money, reducing cost, you're, you're getting new customers and uh, building, building top, uh, top line value. So all this is of course underpinned with compliance and the ability to ensure auditability, improve visibility into business process and uh, improve litigation preparedness. So in conclusion, the Paper paradox is the fact that paper-based barriers within organizations are increasing, even though paper volumes are actually generally decreasing, but document capture technology is close to making this conflict a thing of the past, because capture solutions continue to evolve and enable information integration with enterprise, within enterprise applications forms. But it puts enterprises within grasp of balancing the advantages of digital information with the remaining requirements of those, uh, those paper documents. Open text strategy is to deal with the unstructured part of the world and unstructured is where open text live and where we provide solutions and capturing solutions into business process and business applications can help bridge the gap between unstructured content and structured business process which creates a platform for business transformation, whatever that looks like in, in your business. So Dave, that's how OpenText resolved the paper paradox for customers. Back to you for a Q&A session. George, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So, some really interesting examples there. And I think in, in particular, the, the one that you raised um, that shows actually that, that Capture isn't just for the huge organizations out there. Capture and, and these type of technologies can be deployed wherever and, and still see a benefit. So thank you very much for that. As George said, we're gonna dive into a Q&A session right now. And uh, I'd like to remind you all as attendees that, that you can pose your questions to, to our panel by using the Q&A feature 
that you'll see on the screen at the moment. Um, on our panel, you've already heard from George, um, but George is joined by Johanna Schatt, who is product manager for Open Text as well. So welcome to you both. Um, so if I can if I can kick the question session off with a question to to Johanna. Um, one of the big topics um, in the industry at the moment is the idea of the consumerization of IT, or the end user driving technology forward as opposed to the business. Um, does that have an impact on digital transformation? Um, yeah, I would think in a way it's a third wave in digitization. Um, being the first wave, um, being companies um, using IT equipment to automate their internal processes, which is quite a while ago. Uh, second wave, having companies deal un with each other using digital uh, communications. This is still being explored. Um, supply chain management is still a topic that um, evolves and generates productivity. And the third wave is end users being in uh, in communication with companies using electronic devices and this is a big impact as every when everybody has access to a computer or a uh, being it on the table or in in the pocket um, there is a a strong driving power force to digitize all your processes from end to end fantastic Johannes you you mentioned there the the three uh, phases or three waves. Any idea what the fourth one will be yet, or, or is that too too early to say? Uh, I can only joke. The first one will be a world without humans because it's only digital. <laughs> no, not seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> okay, George, I'm going to going to get you involved at the moment. Um, Another huge area of discussion that, that's going on at the moment is that around data security and, and more specifically, the data privacy of individuals. Now, some of the things that you've talked about suggest using scans of things like passports and driving licenses from end users. Does that pose a data privacy challenge for those end users? Well, for sure, yeah. I mean, you've got to be really careful when you're keeping customers' personally identifiable information just because um, that then makes you a target for identity theft and uh, you're, you're going to get hacks and uh, that information is uh, is a risk for, for getting stolen. There's, there's, there's lots of new regulations coming into place around data protection. Um, there's going to be some pretty high um, uh, fines in, in place for companies that don't look after um, personally identifiable information. And we're finding that more and more, and more companies are, um, are having to, first of all, as part of their process, onboarding processes, maybe as a, uh, a telecoms company or a utility company, onboarding process involves uh, collect personally identifiable information, but then what happens to it once it's in the business, once it's in the process, uh, where is it stored? Are people keeping uh, other copies? Is it is it um, is it safe? Is it encrypted? So that kind of leads to whereabouts in the process um, the that information should be scanned and encrypted, um, you know, obviously as early on as possible. So think of a if you were signing up for a, a mobile telecom, uh, a mobile contracts, the scanning is normally done in the in the store in front of you. So you might take your passport into the shop and they'll scan it there and then. And that information needs to very, very quickly be uh, put into the process that it needs to be put into and then deleted um, or redacted. So uh, another way to handle the information is to, to be able to redact the information. And uh, over, over the years, information may be kept on customers that aren't even with so um, there's an argument for, for being able to do enterprise search across the whole enterprise and being able to um, uh, identify things that look like credit card numbers or passport numbers and, and things like that and being able to highlight where they are and where that information is kept in the business so that you can take action. You can either delete, redact it or encrypt it. So yes, yeah, so, you know the more you the more you capture, the more information you capture, the more you know, the more responsible you, you respons responsible you become to to look after it. And George, just following up on that, um, 
does da is data privacy or, or are data privacy concerns stopping end users from using this sort of technology or is their sort of insatiable desire to use technology actually forcing businesses to adapt and, and allow them to use that technology? I th well, I think end users are actually quite blasé about giving their details away, um, but it's the responsibility of the of the company to look after that and uh, and treat it with respect that it deserves and and delete it when it's no, no longer needed. But um, you know, people are actually quite um, quite willing to give details for a, a quite a small return, a discount of ten percent or something like that. Sure. So the responsibility is still with the, the, the organisation at the end of it. Okay, makes makes perfect sense. So Johannes, back over to yourself. Um, another one of the big topics in IT at the moment is that of analytics, and and specifically within our area, content analytics. Does that have a place uh, in regards to what we're talking about today? Yeah, I think so. Um, actually, Open Text has um, acquired a company not not too long ago um, that has um, provided us uh, with a strong basis of analytics te technology, and uh, we are providing that through online services as well as a product. Uh, which I, I see it's two elements here. One was an immediate reaction of myself because having good analytics tool is uh, interesting for everybody who runs a OCR and capture solution. Um, the key element is automation. So if you have, say, invoice processes and you have some 80 or 90 percent automation rate, you're aiming at 100 percent. That's what you're looking for, um, and um, which means optimization and um, fine-tuning such a system, which relies on data, on exact analytics. What are the issues? Which specific fields? Um, um, cause most of the troubles. Is there a common pattern and, uh, among those? And that is um, their um, analytics tool play a useful role. But that is only a little bit of an insight use. Um, there is, is a much broader element uh, or relationship between content capture and analytics, and that is that being able to automatically capture information can fill up databases that can be used for analytics um, after uh, having been captured. Capturing data has always been concentrating on those data that has been that is needed for a business process. If I have a purchase order application, the only thing I'm interested is in all the items that are on the purchase order, the the, the date, and so forth. Um, but there is other useful information um, maybe on, on such documents, um, like an account number for a, a bank account number or a, a URL of the company and so forth. And you wouldn't capture that data uh, um, because you wouldn't have, could make too much use of that data, especially, especially if, if it's not necessarily complete and available for every purchase order. Um, but if uh, capturing data is more or less free because it's just software, the only thing is you have to pay a license for it, um, but there is no manual labor involved, you capture, can capture more and more data, uh, much more data than is actually needed for the business process at hand, and that gives you valuable insight into your activities when analytics is being applied. So capture is a means to automatically capture data that can later on be um, used by analytics tools. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so the security uh, comments that you made, George, seem to have, have sparked our audience into life here. Um, a couple of questions relating to that. Um, so someone asks, once a document scanned, such as a passport, how do organizations protect themselves from fraud? Obviously, in the past, um, it was a human that was actually looking at that passport and, and detecting whether it was genuine or not. How do you do that in, an, in a digitized environment? Well, at the point of capture, the, uh, there's still a human involved. Um, someone has to decide whether it is a genuine document. Um, this, once it's digitized, then yes, it's uh, it's it's past the point. It's it's been the, the fraud has happened, I guess. Um, the 
once the information is, is digitized, then uh, it can't be tampered with. Uh, it can certainly be secured from that aspect, and that can't be changed. And uh, anyone that to, to look at it, and there'll be a full audit trail and, uh, and history of who's been, who's been looking at it, who's tried to make changes to it. So it certainly couldn't be tampered with after it's been digitized. Um, but at, you know, if someone has a fake passport and, and uh, goes in to open a, um, a mobile phone account, then uh, someone has to um, you know, decide is that a, is that a real passport or not. Um, there's probably some there's well, there are some scanning um, um, uh, scanning standards that could be followed to uh, ensure that what is being scanned is being um, is being digitally and is a true representation, and there's no there's no changes subsequently to that. So there are some security uh, things you can put in that way. Okay, and I guess to, to follow up on that a little bit, um, Johannes, someone's asked talking about mobile capture. Is the processing um, actually done on the device? Is it done in the cloud, or or is it done somewhere else? Um, different companies do it differently. Um, our recommendation is to um, do a couple of things on the device and some in the cloud or in the back end. The um, device part is definitely to um, get the a clear image, to do the um, cropping of the image, to do um, image enhancement. Uh, but doing the data extraction and um, and, and, and OCR um, is better happen, happening in the back end because that is more related to the business process that um, is done in the back end anyways. So our, for example, our travel on demand solution that we, uh, our travel solution for travel documents, um, the document is being cropped and everything. It, we have a dedicated um, data compression algorithm because you need a good quality image to do a, a good OCR. On the other hand, you want, don't want to have a huge uh, data being transmitted. And then data extraction is done on the back end and the data is then stored in, in the uh, travel application for um, travel management. So it's a mixture of those, I'd say. Okay, thank you. Um, back to the data security and the data privacy aspect, someone's asking a question about um, do we see this sort of solution applicable? Um, th they reference the US medical industry with HIPAA information privacy laws, but, but I guess we can open that up to say do we see this sort of a application applicable within the medical industry given the various privacy laws that, are, that there exist within different, different geographies? Uh, George um, or Johannes, whichever one of you guys wants to take that. Yeah, let me take that one. I mean, the the healthcare industry is one of the strongest industries for capture solutions. Um, in in Europe, Europe or Germany, and as well in the US, we are in that business for I don't know how long for for centuries um, because they have so much paper that they um, brought into um, capture technology and capture solution uh, decades ago. Uh, HICFA processing is, is a huge uh, business where uh, our technology is being used all over the US and we have m most of the European or the German uh, health insurance company doing all of the processing of the paper that's, that's coming on. Uh, the privacy issue is of course, always an issue. So um, these data capture um, installations that you have, they have private data. It starts off with a piece of paper that somebody is scanning. He has that piece of paper. And this has become stricter and stricter. Um, who has access to those systems? Who is allowed to see those data? Um, the good thing is the capture solution itself only holds, holds the data for a very short time. It's more the issue of the, the back-end system, uh, which is a repository or a dedicated um, healthcare um, medical system. These, of course, have to provide the uh, a privacy and, and data protection mechanism, like, for example, an archive that uh, does data encryption on REST. Um, and yes, those, those aspects are being taken care of by products 
to a degree that the product can take care of it. There is always the aspect, and that is probably the dominating aspect, is how it's being implemented, what are the SOPs used in the company to um, prevent any um, uh, privacy theft. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you very much for, for taking part in this panel discussion today. Um, it's obviously gone down very well with the audience because we have a couple of people asking how they could possibly become open text resellers. We'll, we'll deal with that one later, but um, we're almost at the hour, so I'll, I'll just start wrapping up the session a little bit. Um, and one of the things that, that we have coming up as AIM is obviously the AIM conference in New Orleans in late April. Um, it will be great if you could join us there. We've already got three exciting keynote speakers lined up. We've got a raft of uh, fantastic edu educational sessions. I'll be heading out there to, to head up some roundtable discussions, and I know that Open Text will be well represented there as well. So for more information, head along to www.aimconference.com uh, for more information and to register, hopefully. We also invite you to check out some of the more in-depth training that AIM provide at aim.org forward slash training. And based on what we've been discussing today, AIM offers training specifically on capture, specifically on business process management. So again, head along to our website. Uh, the address is on the screen at the moment to learn about what classes there are available close to you. Just a reminder that we have recorded this webinar today, and it will be available for you to download and listen to again in the next day or two at the webinars on demand library at the AIM website. I personally like to thank today's underwriter OpenText and without support from our solution providers such as OpenText, AIM wouldn't be able to provide you with these free educational programs. So thank you George, Johannes and the rest of the OpenText team very much. And just before we bring the webinar to a close, I'd like to leave you with some closing thoughts or key takeaways from, from our speakers from today's discussion. So George, sum it up uh, what you'd like us to take away from today. Uh, so far, uh, it's pretty just that digital transformation is, is challenging for enterprises. It's a struggle to cope with the massively increasing volumes of digital information coming to businesses from diverse new sources. So if you can capture that information early on in the business process and integrate it directly into enterprise applications and platforms, then you're generally going to be more digital and more capable of, of business transformation and being able to serve your customers better. So capture early. Fantastic. And Johannes, the same question to yourself. How would you sum things up? Oh, we seem to have lost Johannes off of the line, so uh, I'll just give you my summation. No, 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 no. Again, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Johannes is here. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, oh, sorry, I wasn't moved. No, final, uh, let me just a small uh, reminder. Captcha is a technology that is 40 years old. And the funny thing is that Forrester, just two or three years ago, came up with the claim that this is now an emerging technology, which is kind of funny. So it's, it's, it's gone a long way, and it will go a long way from here. Fantastic. Thank you, Anis. Um, that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a fantastic day. Uh, from AIM headquarters, this is Dave Jones, and we will see you next time.